Hello everyone. Welcome to the Advanced Deep Learning for Computer Vision lecture. Um, today it's the first time that I, I will be giving the lecture. Well, by giving I mean I will make the video. Um, but I think we have some very interesting content. Um, we're going to talk about generative neural networks. And the first thing I would like to do is I would like to give you a bit of an overview of generative neural networks. Um, obviously, you have heard a lot of the terms. Um, we have also heard in the previous lectures um, a lot of discriminative networks. But now we want to talk about generative networks, mostly in the context of computer vision applications, meaning that we want to generate, for instance, an image or we want to generate a video. However, we also want to go over the um, yeah, theoretical concepts that could possibly be applied to other domains, such as you know, audio generation and so on. Um, there's um, th this famous taxonomy of generative models, and there's quite um, a few different ones, actually. Um, the first thing we have to consider always is what does it mean to have a generative model? What, what does it mean, right? Typically, you have a training set, right? And from this training set, such as images, you want to learn a generative model that can kind of, you know, um, generate new images of the same type. And the same type can mean various different things. Um, and most of the time when, we, when we're talking about, you know, what are image types and stuff like that, it's mostly referred to a density. Um, in other words, we have a training set, right? And we want to learn some sort of density. Um, from which we can later on sample um, in order to generate new samples that follow the same distribution. Um, but of course, the samples should not match whatever we have found in the training set. Now, there's two different types. There's like implicit densities and there's going to be explicit densities. Um, and the difference between those is in an explicit density, you're going to have eventually a loss function that, that explicitly models the density you're doing. Um, we'll later talk about autoregressive networks, um, you have seen variational autoencoders. These kind of things fall into the categories of explicit densities because here you have a loss function that explicitly models it. At the same time, there's other generative networks such as implicit densities. Um, generative adversarial networks is the main thing we will talk about mostly today um, that falls into that category. Here we are still learning a density, but it is not explicitly modeled by a loss function. And, um, you know, there are certain implications if you do that. Um, you have certain features, um, but also certain drawbacks um, if you're having an implicit density. Yeah, I would first like to give you um, a bit of an overview of the generative models or the generative uh, neural networks we're going to talk about. And first of all, we're going to talk about, about GANs because, you know, the, most of you might have heard about them, um, but I, I still want to talk about it um, because they're just so relevant today, right? There are so many methods and so many different research works around GANs um, that, that in one way or another build on, on generative adversarial networks. Um, we will also talk about conditional GANs, um, meaning that at some point we have learned some sort of implicit density with a GAN, right? Um, at some point, you want to control the generation process. If you're talking about a plan GAN, you don't have a lot of control. Um, but we will talk about how can we actually make GANs useful for certain applications, right? How can we force certain styles of images to be created? How can we force, um, for instance, a video with certain animations to be created and so on? Um, and I think this part here is pretty, pretty exciting, um, specifically for, you know, content creation applications, um, artistic applications and so on. So when you're going to make GANs practical, this is very interesting because here you can basically give it the right control um, depending on what your what the underlying task is going to be. We'll also talk about autoregressive networks, um, mainly because they're, I think they're theoretically very interesting because these are the dominant um, generative models right now that actually have explicit densities. Um, and they might not be as popular right now as GANs, um, but I think you know, that comes and goes. There's like certain research trends. Um, I think um, autoregressive networks are pretty important um, for various reasons and um, not just in the visual domain, mostly for audios. Most of the state-of-the-art networks actually are uh, autoregressive there at this point. We will also talk about null rendering. Um, that's kind of a, an interesting thing that a, a lot of the research we're doing, for instance, in our group. Um, and the idea there is we want to couple, you know, traditional generation methods, such as what we know from computer graphics, for instance, um, and want to want to combine it with with generative um, neural networks. Um, I will go into a little bit of detail later on what, what I mean by that. Um, but I think it is fair to say that, you know, if you're looking at some of the progress in the research community in the last like two or three years, 
um, null rendering has become a really big thing basically um, you can now instead of having explicit 3d graphics methods you can use um, neural networks in order to to kind of generate cutting edge content um, especially for video generation or for capturing 3d environments this is currently one of the state of the arts so in a sense we have basically two theoretical blocks we want to go over the gans and the auto regressive networks and then we have the conditional gans and the neural rendering techniques to make things a little bit more practical now i mentioned i wanted to start with the gans um, and these are as i said they have the implicit densities and the idea is um, that we can learn these from a given training data set and then we can draw new samples from certain distributions right and then we can these samples lie inside of the distribution but they are new samples that are not identical with any of the training samples right so for instance if you have a data set of faces you can basically generate new faces they still are faces but you can generate new variations of the different people in these faces good um yeah generative adversarial networks um, i will probably always refer to them as gans in 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 the next few slides um, they have reached a lot of popularity actually and one, one thing to measure popularity is if you're looking at the number of research papers that have appeared um, this is not uh, quite up to date this graph it goes until you know early of 2019 um, but you can see here is the the time period of papers right um, and here's the number of papers that have appeared at the respective um, uh, publication venues in this case I think they're from archive um, you, you can see, you know, like 2014, you had barely any GAN papers. And now um, you have, per month, you have almost 500 papers, right? So this is kind of a very, this is the very rapid growth rates of papers that have uh, GAN um, in, in the title. And this is pretty impressive, I think. So you can see there's a lot of people looking into it. Um, yeah, the reason why I think it's so interesting is because it kind of showed different ways now how to generate images compared to, to standard pipelines and it opened up a lot of possibilities um, for practical reasons. Um, and we'll talk about this um, in this lecture and I hope at the end of the day, um, you know, we can all use GANs and, and, and various generative models to do kind of fun stuff. Now, I, I want to quickly go over the basics again. Um, I know some of the things we have already covered in, in the Introduction to Deep Learning course. Um, but just for completeness, not everybody might have heard it um, in the last semester, so I still want to quickly do a small recap here. Um, we have talked um, about convolutions and deconvolutions. I understand everybody knows what a convolutional network is right now, right? So we have here, uh, we have here some input image, right? Um, we're going to here have the output and we have this 3 by 3 conf kernel that is, that is being shifted um, over the input image and in this case, we have four valid locations. There's no padding, no stride. So we are with this four by four image. We're gonna generate a two by two feature map with this conf kernel. Now the transpose convolutions are essentially the opposite, right? So here we have the input here um, is this grid here. We have basically two by two um, valid pixels here in the input. And what we wanna do is we wanna make out of two by two, we wanna make four by four pixels as the output. Yeah, and the way you do this is kind of this learnable upsampling. Um, in this case, again, we have no padding and no stride. Um, in this case, uh, we have uh, yeah, we have these four feature locations, but basically um, we just expand the values, right? And then we run this conf kernel over it. Um, same thing as convolution, except now we have a transpose kernel. And this way we can basically have instead of four, uh, if, instead of going down the resolution, we can go up in the resolution. Now, using the the well, I should say one thing, right? Obviously, in the literature, deconvolutions are often renamed in various different ways. We have seen them as upconvolutions, um, transpose convolutions, um, deconvolutions, same thing. Different people call them differently. Um, I don't have a strong preference. Most of the time, I will just say it's a deconvolution. Um, but that's just because I got used to it. But it, it's not like um, the other terms are necessarily wrong. Yeah, with these building blocks, with convolutions and deconvolutions, um, you can devise architectures such as autoencoders. Um, the idea of an autoencoder is we have a series of convolutions that go from a higher resolution input to a lower resolution feature map. Um, this feature map here in the middle is called the bottleneck layer. Um, it's doing what it says, right? It's a bottleneck. Basically, it's compressing the content to a smaller dimensionality of the features here. Um, meaning that you have to, to have to learn some sort of um, encoding of the image. And then what you do is you have a, a decoder 
this is composed of a series of deconvolutions. So we have this learnable upsampling and we go here from this bottleneck layer again to the original resolution. And the idea is that we have these convolutions, we have these deconvolutions. This can be a fully convolutional architecture, right? Sometimes you have a couple of fully connected layers here in the middle, but often you also have, you don't have that, you just have a fully, connect, a fully convolutional architecture. And um, yeah, but with that, you, you can design this architecture now, right? Um, the question is, how do we train that? Well, the most common thing for architecture uh, for autoencoders is we, we're going to have a reconstruction loss. So what we're doing here is we have some sort of input image on the left-hand side. We're feeding this into our, our encoder into the bottleneck layer. It's being compressed down to, to, a, to a lower resolution feature map. Um, we have a decoder that goes up to the original resolution. We have an output image. And what we do is we have a reconstruction loss that says, oh, this output image should be similar to the input image. You can use an L1 or L2 loss here. Um, um, it's a very simple regression loss, basically, um, and it wants and the network is being optimized such that um, it wants to do this reconstruction. Um, yeah, practically, what you have is this latent space Z here. This is this what we get in the bottleneck. Um, this dimensionality is typically significantly lower than the input, right? So of course, the spatial resolution gets smaller, the feature map resolution gets higher, but the total result, the total dimensionality of the latent space Z. Um, is supposed to be significantly lower, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, if you if you do this and train this, you have here a bunch of input images, right? Um, and you're training this and you're getting um, a series of reconstructed images. Um, there's also the distinction right now, if you're saying you have a training and a validation set, right? If you're taking a training set, essentially what this network here is learning, it's kind of learning a lowering approximation of the input. It's actually very similar to what a PCA would do, except that this is not a linear but a nonlinear model, but you have the same idea that you have kind of this um, encoding of a higher dimensional input, in this case an image, right, into a lower dimensionality uh, in the bottleneck layer. And yeah, and then we can do the reconstruction by having the loss at the end of the day. It's a self-supervised uh, learning, a lot of people call it unsupervised learning. I like to call it self-supervised because you still have a loss here. Um, but the nice thing is to train an autoencoder, you don't need any, any additional annotations or labels, right? It's completely self-supervised. Um, you're gonna feed in an image, you're gonna reconstruct the image again. So all you have to do is you have to have a data set of images in this case to train it. Um, yeah, now we can argue, what are we learning? <laughs> um, and that the hope, or at least what, what, what we assume what we would learn is we learned kind of a compression network, right? So we, we're compressing this higher level input into a lower level um, feature map, and then we are um, going back to the original resolution. It's, it's in a sense, it's like learning some sort of compression. Um, now it's not perfect, it's not a lossless compression as we can already see here, right? We have here the input images and we feel the reconstructed image. You see these images are a little bit blurry. Um, that is based on the fact that, well, depending on how we do the optimization, it's based on what kind of loss we're going to use. Um, we will very quickly see that the, the loss, the L2 loss might not be the ideal one because essentially you're learning some sort of mean average um, over the training set um, and so on. Um, but I'm sure you've heard of autoencoders in the context a lot for, for, for you know, unsupervised learning. You can use clustering in this feature space. Um, you can find dominant axis um, similar to principal component axis, right? This is why I'm, I'm, I'm making the comparison to PCA here. Um, you can kind of find clustering um, in your data set. Um, but now we wanted to talk about generative models. The question is how is an autoencoder useful here? Well, the idea is what we can do is we can train this autoencoder at training time with a training set. And then at test time, what we're doing is we're simply, we're simply chopping off um, the encoder part. And now what we do is we just have a decoder. So this decoder was pre-trained in this case. Um, and at test time, what we do is we just feed in random vectors here in the latent layer. And then we're hoping we're getting an original image as output again, right? Um, and assuming we've done a good job at, you know, learning this, if I go back quickly, at learning this latent space here from the input, we assume that we have a reasonable, um, but we have a reasonable decoder that can kind of figure out how to make a real image out of this one again. So we can kind of reconstruct from this compressed representation a real image, right? So the idea why, why I mentioned compression here is a good one because 
if this is compressed and I can kind of have the space of all valid real images of a certain domain in here encoded, this is a very dense space compared to the possible output space. And if that is the case, right, you, you would assume that whatever you're feeding in here, you're gonna get a reasonable images output. Now, of course, in practice, it's not gonna be so simple. Of course, the space is still pretty high dimensional in the latent space, and you can still, you know, get a lot of garbage as output, um, but that's kind of the high level intuition, what you, how you can assume this, right? Um, okay, but anyway, so a test time, what we do is we, we just feed in a random vector here. So, and we wanna do a reconstruction from this random vector, right? Um, and then we're gonna get, um, we're going to get an output image. And what you can do also is you can say, well, you pre-train the autoencoder, but you can also go ahead and say, well, you know, instead of pre-training it, I'm just going to train it by, by feeding in random vectors here to begin with. And then you're reconstructing the output image, right? So you can also train directly on this one. So you don't have to pre-train on the autoencoder itself, but you can also just random vector, give me some output. And then you can also go ahead and say, oh, because I trained on this, I can also add some sort of semantic meaning into this here, right? Um, depending on what kind of training set you have. So you can say, oh, if my first, uh, my first component of my latent vector is going to be um, having a high value that corresponds to a certain semantic correlation, what we see later on um, in the output image. In this case, um, yeah, in this case, what you would assume is that, you know, the network just learns a mapping from these uh, from the latent space to the respective output. Um, and this is one of the very first works. Um, this is actually a paper from Alex Dostoevsky. He was in Freiburg um, at the time. And you can train a network like this and then you can go ahead and say, oh, I'm going to interpolate between my latent space, right? I can go ahead and say, oh, I have a latent space of this image. I have a latent space of that image. And I just want to do a linear interpolation in this latent code that I've just optimized for. Uh, and then I'm getting intermediate results that show kind of a natural transition between the two images. And these guys have been doing this on, um, well, we, th these guys have been doing this on single, on single shapes. So it was a very, very early paper. You see it's 2014 is the publication date. Um, so they could basically interpolate between these two chair models. This is the source. This is one image that they have. They compute a latent code for that. And they have another one here. Uh, this is the target, and then they simply interpolate in the latent code, and this like gradually transitions between these chairs. And the nice thing is now we have our first generative model, meaning that we can now, based on this latent code, we can control or we can generate new images here. Very good. Um, yeah, in practice, you can also change viewpoints here. You you can uh, morph between <laughs> the chairs, right? Um, and you have some certain control of the appearance. You see, this is not very sharp. This is not an artifact right now in the video. This is actually um, a little bit low resolution. Um, um, but again, this is a paper from like uh, six years ago. Um, but I wanted to highlight, this was one of the first papers that actually had this explicit control now um, from a latent code to a respective target. Um, again, this is still the same idea. We still have this simple, uh, yeah, decoder from an autoencoder as a generative model right now, right? Very straightforward and um, we're getting these kind of results. Now, one thing is what we noticed very quickly, what I mentioned is, you know, the image outputs were relatively blurry. And one, one reason why that happens is because of our reconstruction loss. In this case, right, we have, we have this L2 loss that I mentioned. This is what a lot of people do. You can use, of course, an L1 or Huber loss too. But in, in, in practice, you have one of these losses and if we're having an L1 loss, um, the optimum is kind of the mean, right? You, like you always tend to blur because if you have one outlier, you have like a sharp edge that gives you an outlier in the loss, the network will favor like smooth transitions over sharp uh, edges. It's just naturally when you're using an L2 loss. That's by definition what an L2 loss is doing. So it's not gonna, gonna favor like outliers, um, but in this case, we care about these outliers because this is where we get sharp edges that make an image look, look realistic, right, and less blurry. So the idea now is the problem is we want to replace this L2 loss. And well, ideally what I would like to do is I would like to go ahead and tell you, hmm, um, what is a good loss function that tells me is it a realistic image or not, right? What, what, like how do I do that? Well, I'm going to look at the image and I just know it immediately because I have a good sense of what makes a real image and what's a synthetic image, right? Um, but if you're telling this a loss function, this is more, more difficult, right? And 
The core idea now is instead of using like a fixed function here, what we would like to do is we like to learn that function. So in other words, we, in other words, we want to have um, a, a function that tells me how realistic is the image. Or maybe not even realistic, so how much does it match a certain distribution? So if I have a training distribution, I would like to train a loss that tells me, oh, like how, how, how good or how well does it match my distribution? And this is the core idea of GANs. This is the, the, the core idea of a generative adversarial network. So here what we're doing is, well, this part here is our, our, our decoder of an autoencoder, basically, it's the decoder part. And um, we have in here our latent vector, which we had before. We have here our generator, which is nothing else but a decoder network, right? It goes from a lower dimensional feature vector. In this case, it's a random variable, but it could be a lower dimensional feature vector too. Um, it goes to an image in this case, that's our sample. So the generated G takes as input the random variable Z, that's the latent space code, um, and then it generates an image as output. And now instead of having an L2 loss here, what we do is we feeding, we, we're trying to learn, is this a real image or not? And since we have no clue how to define this loss function, we just use another neural network, in this case our discriminator, this is a second neural network, um, that is a binary classifier that tells us is this image that we just generated with G, is this real or is it fake? And this is our D, this is our discriminator. Um, now, how does the discriminator know whether this is real or not? He needs to have some comparison to a real image. Um, so what we're doing is we have a binary classification task and we're feeding in real samples and fake samples. And the discriminator tries to distinguish whether this one or whether it tries to figure out for a given sample, is it real or is it fake? So what we do is we randomly feed in either real or either fake ones, and the discriminator is being trained, is it true or is it not true, with a simple binary cross entropy loss. And the idea is, of course, I'm not gonna feed always um, this one in, so I'm just gonna randomly feed in fake and real samples, right? So the discriminator um, has to figure out, based on the content of the image, is it real or is it fake? Um, the idea why we do have the discriminator though is not that we have a discriminator at the end. The idea is that we're training both generator and discriminator at the same time. And the goal of the generator now is to make sure that it fulfills this kind of learned loss function from the discriminator. And the learned loss function means I want to trick the discriminator. I want to make sure that this guy here can generate images that this guy here cannot distinguish anymore from these ones, right? If I had a perfect discriminator and I, I knew exactly, oh, that's a real image or not, I can generate an image like that, that this guy can't tell apart anymore, then by definition it has to be a real image. Now it's a little bit more tricky than that, right? And the reason why it's a bit more tricky is because, well, if this is a fixed network, then you're gonna have this problem that if I'm just training a generator, you will just generate some artificial noise, we call this adversarial noise, um, that will be generated eventually, that will trick this network. So you have to train these two things at the same time. You have to train a generator and a discriminator at the same time, and eventually the discriminator will give you gradients that help to make the generation better. That's the core idea um, of GANs. This is like, this is why it's an adversarial network. These, the generator and the discriminator, they, they fight each other, right? They try to trick each other. The generator tries to generate samples that, that look real, that the discriminator can't tell apart from the real images anymore, and the discriminator tries to tell apart whether this is a real or not a real image. Okay, um, typically um, for, the, the, for the, the, the notation here, we typically call the latent random variable here is z. This is just a random vector, um, typically sampled from a Gaussian, or could be a uniform distribution too. Um, mostly it's a Gaussian. Um, we have a generated g. We have g of z, which is our generated sample. We have x, which is our real world image, real world sample. Again, it doesn't have to be an image, but we're going to mostly do it for images right now. Um, we have our discriminated d, and d of x should, you know, is the real sample. Um, that the discriminator should say, hey, it's real. 
Uh, and the GOZ is the discriminator is now evaluating the generated sample and hope, well, hopefully for the discriminator it's gonna say it's a fake image, right? Um, okay, and yeah, if you're looking at these two things, um, we have real data on one hand side and fake data on the other hand side. And the idea is but by, by this, you know, comp competing process, but this adversarial process here, uh, we eventually getting good fake images. We're eventually getting good images that the generator um, can do. Um, and the idea is that this then lies, essentially what we're hoping that um, we can, this is a certain distribution of real images. We hope that the generator will also uh, generate certain images that lie inside of the distribution. That's also why we call it an implicit distribution, what we're learning here, because we have no explicit loss to match the distribution here. We're just hoping by training the generator and discriminator at the same time, we hope that we, we're learning this distribution implicitly. Okay, um, yeah, but if you're looking at the, at the two discriminator and, and generator processes, um, if you're taking a real sample here, right, we're putting a real sample here um, as input to our discriminator T, D, um, and D of X tries to be near one, right? It tries to say, hey, this is a real image. I try to recognize that this one is a real image. Um, for the fake images, I'm gonna start with some random noise, and out of this random noise, or random variable, or uh, random latent code, I would like to generate an image, and this is what my generator G is doing. So it generates an image, which is, uh, it's a sample from our model, right? Um, this one we're feeding it into our discriminator, and the discriminator tries to make sure that D of the generated sample is near zero, and G tries to make sure that this one gets near one, right? This one, the generator tries to make sure, oh, I'm fooling my discriminator. I'm trying to make sure that I can generate something that you, you can't tell apart anymore from the real world. Uh, and the discriminator tries to make sure I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna nail you down. I'm gonna know which one is real and which one is fake, right? Um, and these two things run in parallel, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna feed in real images, training the discriminator, and I'm gonna train feed in random noise variables to train both discriminator and generator at the same time. Now, if you're looking at the loss functions, uh, we have here uh, a discriminator loss and we have a generator loss. Um, if you're talking about the discriminator, I mentioned this before, this is nothing else but a binary cross entropy loss, right? So if we are feeding in, so in this case, we're having here the, the real samples X, right? Um, this is our, our positive label, this is our one label. Um, and then we have here our generated sample. This is our negative label where the discriminator should say, oh, this one should be wrong, right? This one should be one and this one should be zero. Uh, and the generator is just trying to fool the discriminator, right? We're just gonna go ahead and say, oh yeah, just please, please maximize the loss uh, basically of the discriminator, right? Okay, um, and we're optimizing for these two things at the same time. So we're playing a little game. We're having this minimax game. So. G minimizes the probability that D is correct, right? We wanna make sure that our, here our generator tries to fool the discriminator. Um, and equilibrium is essentially the settle point, right? There's no convergence in this case. Like there's, there's nothing like it says, oh, now, now I fooled the discriminator, but then I can train the discriminator again. And it's gonna say, oh, now I know it again. And these, these two things, they, they mutually get better by helping each other to get better. And I mentioned this motivation before where we're saying, oh, we have kind of this learnable loss function, that what D is. D is essentially a learnable loss function, if you, if you will want to say it so. Um, and D then provides the loss function, or this learnable loss function, this discriminator, provides the supervision for G because we're training these at the same time. And because of that, um, we, we're, getting, uh, yeah, we're getting the supervision uh, for the generator. Um, now, one thing what people have noticed, this was the very first um, formulation of, of the GANs here that Goodfellow provided in this very popular 2014 paper. Um, th this idea um, of like saddle points and equilibriums is not necessarily something that was introduced uh, in the GAN papers, but for this specific context it was. And the idea now is basically that we're having this discriminator here. Um, one problem what might happen is that the generator here um, yeah, this might be still a bit of a problem because the generator might always be wrong, right? So 
Um, basically, if you're never going to get a, a, a good a good real sample, uh, sorry, a good fake sample generated, then this loss from the generator will always be high and this loss will always be low. And you, the problem is there's no like smooth function basically that tells the generator how to get better. And oftentimes what people do is instead of having this like uh, just the negative uh, discriminator, what people do is they use this heuristic method. Um, if I'm going back, this one is still a binary cross entropy for the uh, discriminator. But for the generator now, we have the negative log likelihood um, that, that it, it, um, the discriminator of the generator is right, right? Of the generated images is right, right? Um, and this is a little bit different. In this case, we, we, we maximize the log probability of D being mistaken instead of just taking the negative loss function of both. Um, the idea behind this heuristic method is that G can still learn even when the discriminator checks all the samples, right? And that's often the case because in principle, you're gonna have this issue um, that generation is a lot harder than discrimination. Right? If I have one wrong pixel, in principle, I know it's a fake image. I mean, it's not so easy, it has to still learn it, but um, generation is in principle harder than discrimination. Uh, sorry, discrimination is easier than generation. Um, and this one is why we have typically this negative log likelihood. Um, and I can already say, like, this is the standard GAN formulation that most people use today. Again, we're going to go into a lot of different formulations later, but this is one of the formulations that a lot of people are using. Um, yeah, so the idea is that G can still learn even when D rejects all samples because this log loss will not be, like, so extreme. This log likelihood that makes it easier. Okay, um, in practice, when you're training this, um, you just have both losses, right? And you just train them at the same time. Now, if you do this, um, as I already mentioned, what often happens is the discriminator will just always dominate the generator. And often you do an alternating gradient update, meaning that you fix the generator, you do an update to the discriminator. So you only train the discriminator for one step. And the next step would be now we're fixing the discriminator and we're performing one gradient step to the generator. And you just alternate, right? You do this and that and this and that and this and that and this and that and this and that. Um, this is easier for certain things. Um, the one thing is basically we only have gradients for half of the network. So we either need to train generator or discriminator. We can have bigger networks. That's one advantage. Um, but it's also a little bit more stable um, be because you, you don't have so many unknowns you're training at the same time. So often this alternating update has been being used. I'm saying has because Nowadays, I think people mostly train it actually jointly. They figured out how to stabilize it with various tricks, right? Um, but one thing you can do in this alternating update steps, you can say, well, if my discriminator is too strong, I can simply train my generator here. I can train the generator more often. So I can do one step here. I can, let's say, five steps here. One step, five steps, one step, five steps. Or I can also do it Adaptively, I can check the loss function until my discriminator loss goes down to a certain level. I'm going to do these updates. Now I fooled the generator. Now I'm going to go ahead and go to the generator again. I'm going to train the generator until my generator loss goes down. Um, and this way you can balance the two losses so you don't, you don't collapse. And I'm, I'm mentioning this collapse word now a couple of times. Collapsing means typically when the generator um, is always wrong and the discriminator is always right which is a problem when you don't generate anything. You basically have a teacher that tells you whatever you're doing is wrong, but it doesn't tell you how. Okay, so this is this vanilla again. Um, so what you do is right for number of training iterations, um, what you do, uh, you sample a mini batch of M noise samples. This is our latent code. So we have our random variable Z. Uh, we sample our, our real images X from the training data. Um, and then what we do is we update the discriminator a couple of times, right? And in, in this case, we have this K loop here that goes over this one here, right? Um, and what we do is we simply train, in this case, the binary cross entropy loss of the discriminator. Now you can argue that you're, you're still updating both weights here. You could also say, oh, I'm only gonna update the discriminator weights. That's what I'm saying. Like sometimes um, you can split this apart depending on how it goes. Um, the second part then is here, now you sample the mini batch of the noise samples and then you're only training the, the generator part. Um, in this case here, we actually training the discriminator a couple of times and we're only training the generator once. Um, 
Yeah, I should say this might not always be a good idea. It depends a little bit on how these noise functions behave, uh, how these training functions behave. You can see in the losses, if your training loss goes wild, and wild in this case means if my discriminator goes to zero, I'm pretty, I'm, I did something wrong. A very good debugging stand at the beginning of training again is train this function and check that it goes down to zero. If, you, if, the, if the discriminator can go down to zero without training the, the generator, then something must be fishy. That's just a simple debug step because we will see training these GANs is actually very, very tricky. Um, okay, but anyway, what I'm trying to say is in the vanilla GAN version, you can you can decide, like there's various versions how to, how, to, how to alternate between these things. And typically what people do is they look at the loss functions. They wanna like in the training schedule to check already like how, how strong are my updates. Okay, if you're looking at a training process, it looks something like this, this is train on MNIST. So we hopefully generate some real numbers. Um, for MNIST, this problem is relatively easy, right? Um, meaning that we have a small data set, right? And hopefully after, after a couple of minimax games, um, we, we, hopefully con we hopefully get something reasonable. Again, we're not converging here. We're still in this equilibrium state where the generator and the discriminator, they balance each other out. Um, yeah, let's have a look at the loss curves. Um, that is actually something that is very interesting. Um, in this, oh yeah, one thing I should say here, like whenever you're visualizing the GANs, what you do is, like in your TensorFlow um, framework, for instance, what you're going to do is you have, this one is a fixed lat latent sample, so, so you have a couple of fixed random vectors where you wanna wanna display stuff. And for every iteration, you're displaying always the same random variable here, same random variable here, same random variable here. Um, so they will chitter around based on the training progress, but in principle, we should get sharper and sharper results. And ideally, in this case, you should see the, the visual appearance um, of these numbers. Okay, um, one thing that is very important, I'm looking at the loss functions. Um, we see here two examples. We see a standard minimax game. We see a heuristic method. Again, practice, most people use heuristic methods today. Um, training losses should look something like that or can look something like that, right? You have here, um, ignore, the, ignore the, <laughs> the, the loss curves here right now. Um, th th this depends, of course, how you, how you display it. But I mean, if the generator is like, like if you're going back to the loss function here, this is just the plane loss in this case. Um, this is just negative uh, discriminator, that's why this loss is negative here. But um, let's ignore that for now. Basically, like in this case, the generator would, would like to go up here, right? Uh, sorry, the generator would like to go down here and this guy uh, would like to go down here. Um, okay, but um, what we see in this training process is that we see a relatively stable training, right? So these two losses, they don't change too much. Um, even in this case here of the heuristic methods, well, yeah, they go a little bit apart but they don't, they don't fully go apart, right? A little bit, yes, but not, not too much. And after a few iterations, um, you would expect that they, they're relatively stable. This is an interesting thing. <laughs> so now the, the problem is, um, when you're looking at the loss curves, um, I don't know when I'm converged, right? I have no clue, like this loss function doesn't tell me um, how far am I in my training process yet, or how, how good is the quality of my generated samples yet. Um, a good learning, or a good training curve for GAN is that it's relatively stable. I will go into second also about bad learning curves. Um, uh, sorry, bad training curves. Um, bad training curves would be that if this discriminator here goes to zero, it's still at 0.6 here. If this one went down to zero, then you have a problem because that would mean that we are collapsed and the discriminator is always right. That's an issue. Um, I should say also one thing. Whenever the discriminator collapses to zero, there's no recovery. <laughs> Once this happens, then you can restart your training. Like um, This often happens already at the very beginning, which is, in a sense, good news for you. You don't have to wait two days. You know immediately when um, when you collapsed, and then you can already go ahead and uh, change some parameters, fix your bugs, and so on, and, and restart the process. Um, yeah, this is typically how these losses look like. These are some generated samples. I mean, on MNIST, everything looks kind of okay, so there's no big difference between minimax and heuristics. You could argue this one looks a little bit broken here. This one looks a bit broken. Yeah, they look similar, I guess. There's not so much of a difference here. Okay, these are very simple loss functions right now for the GAN that we use. So we have a generate and discriminator loss, right? We're trying to optimize them jointly, either with alternating or with joint training and so on. Now, 
what we want to do now is, of course, we want to generate something that is a bit more interesting than MNIST images, but we want to go to real images. Um, and there was this, well, one of the first architectures here um, that people have proposed was a convolutional architecture. It's this DC GAN paper, deep convolutional GAN paper. The idea is um, we're starting with a hundred dimensional latent code Z. Uh, we're reshaping this to a, a four by four quote unquote feature map. Each feature is um, 1024 dimensional. Then we have one conf, one conf, one conf, one conf. These are all deconvolutions. This is our decoder, right? Um, basically, what's happening here is we're going to reduce the feature dimension, right, until we had a feature dimension of three for RGB for our image. Um, and we're going to make our spatial size bigger from four to four to eight by eight to 16 times 16, 13, two times 32, and 64 times 64. So this generator here generates 64 uh, squared images and we can apply this to all kinds of data. So this again is one of the first architectures people have, have used there and it's still being used today. It's a, it's a reasonable architecture, right? It's basically, well, what are you doing? You're starting with a random vector, right? You're reshaping it um, to a four by four feature map and then you're doing deconvolutions until you end up with um, your desired image size. Um, oh yeah, by the way, <laughs> the bigger the image size, the harder this gets, right? Um, in order to get a, a big image coherently generated, you have to do a lot of things right with the generator. And we will see that later how difficult it is to generate um, yeah, bigger images. Okay, um, yeah, here are some results on MNIST. Um, again, looks pretty reasonable. Um, here are some results on Celeb A. Celeb A is one of the data sets you will probably use a couple of times in the context of GANs. Um, these are basically portrait photos of human faces where the face is relatively centered. It looks relatively straightforward, um, which makes the problem somewhat more tractable, right? Basically, since we are trying to implicit, learn an implicit distribution here, um, if, you, if the distribution is smaller, um, the problem becomes a lot, a lot easier, right? Um, if I'm taking like this problem here of MNIST, my distribution of these bunch of like um, MNIST numbers is, is pretty straightforward. So of course it's an easy problem. Um, yeah, faces are more complicated, but the problem is here for, for Celeb A, it's a bit relaxed because they're all centered, right? And there's all sorts of biases. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but there's not, it's not a realistic representation of the human population here, right? These are celebrities. Um, uh, that's what the Celeb data set. Um, and and, and th they are a relatively small distribution of people, basically. Okay. Bottom line, though, is this is a good data set to start training against because it's a bit easier. Um, and in this case, we have about 200,000 images we train, right? In this case, these are the results that you're getting with DC GAN. Um, yeah, looks okay, right? It's not too bad. Um, we, we're getting, getting some, <laughs> some faces. Um, they look okay. -ish. They're not perfect. Um, yeah. But you, you can see already now <clears throat> we're getting to, to somewhat reasonably sized images, right? It's not like just simple MNIST numbers anymore. We can do something with faces. Uh, here's another result on the, on the Asian face data set. Again, we get reasonably reasonable faces. Again, I would like to highlight um, these are also, it's also a relatively easy data set. Again, portrait mainly face centered makes it a lot easier for the network. Um, here um, is an example when you sample through the latent codes. Um, this is, oh no, sorry, this is actually the training process, I think. This is basically, it starts here, it starts blurry, this is always the same latent code, um, and then in theory it gets sharper and sharper. Um, yeah, again, same problem. Um, we don't know when we're converged. All we can do basically for debugging is we're looking at, at, these, at these generated images. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about that one right now. I wanted to talk about how do we know this stuff is working or not working and what do we do if it doesn't work? Um, and I can tell you a fair warning at the beginning when you're trying this out, a lot of things won't work because it's very tricky to train these GANs. Um, and we'll get into this in a second why it's so tricky. But let, let, let's look at the debugging steps, what we can do. Well, what we can do is we can definitely do this here. Um, we can again set up TensorBoard. Every end iterations, we just take a fixed number of latent sample codes, right? Uh, and we're looking up always the same uh, set of, of latent codes. And ideally, they're getting sharper and sharper and sharper, which 
um, I guess you can see here to some degree, um, but um, yeah, I guess this, this GIF here um, starts at the very beginning when it starts, it's, it's very blurry and then it gets better and better. If, um, yeah, there's a few things we, we can later talk about. Um, one problem might be mode collapse. Um, one problem might be that all of these ones look the same eventually. Um, that's a problem. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that one. That means, well, my generator generated one real image, um, but it's, it's always the same image. That's also a bit of a problem. Or sometimes you end up with a bunch of them. Um, this is a common problem you can see very quickly here if you mode collapse. And if you mode collapse, um, early on, I mentioned this, you can hardly recover from that during the train. Uh, we can look at the loss curves. Yeah, these are good loss curves, by the way. Um, good loss curves meaning I have the discriminator loss here, we have the generator loss. It's a bit wild at the beginning, at the very beginning, right? It fluctuates a bit. And yeah, then after a little bit, you know, you so this one goes a little bit down, this one goes a little bit up, but eventually, you know, they kind of stabilize here. Um, don't go to zero, none of them. Um, they don't go well. There's a little bit of fluctuation, but in principle, they are doing all fine. Um, that is considered to be a good training curve, right? Because we don't have, we, we, we kind of managing to hold this equilibrium, at least from a loss standpoint. That doesn't mean necessarily it works, but if the loss was not stable, then I know for sure it did not work. So it's, it's one criterion what we can do here to look at it. Um, yeah, when are we done here? We don't know. We can train for a long time. Um, in principle, it's getting better and better. And assuming my model capacity is good enough and I have enough training data, and my distribution should also get better. Um, but I can tell you, oh, now I'm done with my training, right? Um, for this one, I have to go back, look at the images. Um, I'll later go into a few details on how to evaluate. Is it a good image or not? Um, yeah, but I can already tell you it's difficult. Yeah, I can also show you some bad curves. <laughs> bad training curves would look like that. Um, this is a canonical curve a lot of people will get when they try and GANs out the first time. What's going to happen is this is our nice discriminator, right? This is our, again, training epochs. And what happens, this one goes straight down to zero. This one goes up. It will still stay here and go a little bit. There will be still a bit of fluctuation. Um, but you can see this one collapsed, this one went to zero, this one went up, no recovery from here, restart, fix your box, um, fix the training data, fix your schedule and stuff like that. In this case, something went terribly wrong. Um, again, good training curves look like that. Um, I like showing them, they look pretty, right? They, they start wild a little bit at the beginning, but eventually they're gonna, they're gonna um, balance each other out. This is like what's considered to be a good curve. Again, very important if you're looking at the discriminator, discriminator should not go down to zero. If discriminator goes down to zero, something went really, really wrong. Um, well, we have here another one. Um, by the way, I just, I just typed into Google good training curves for, uh, for GANs. Actually, no, I didn't do that. I just typed in training curves for GANs and then I picked the good and the bad ones. <laughs> okay, again, good one, goes a little bit wild here, right? Discriminator stabilizes, goes a little bit wild here, uh, generator also stabilizes. Um, again, very important that, that the stabilization happens. Okay, um, yeah, I mentioned the training schedules. Um, we've seen for, for discriminative networks, you need training schedules, like how to adapt your learning rate and stuff like that. Um, we have the same thing here. Now the problem is we have to adapt both of them. We have to train discriminator and generator. I mentioned this in the altern um, alternating schedules. Basically what you do is you have these thresholds, while loss discriminator greater than threshold, train discriminator, while loss generator greater than loss uh, threshold of generator, uh, train, train generator, right? Um, again, this is not always what's happening today. You can train them at the same time if you fit in your model, if your batch size can be large enough for whatever you need and so on. And yeah, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of different things how you, um, how you can balance these two things. So this is basically the one thing that you have to play around with and it's, um, you need to get a bit of experience which setting to use. And the problem is of course, depending on your problem statement, these settings will be completely different. So, yeah, one thing um, I want to discuss a little bit about the strength of the discriminator. So what is the strength of the discriminator going to do? Um, well, the whole point of again is that we have this equilibrium, right? That these two things, they balance each other out um, and none of them collapses. Because you could say, well, my discriminator is weak. It's not a big problem, right? Because my generator can now generate great images. But my problem is, if my discriminator is too weak, I'm getting not very good gradients to train my generator. Again, 
There's no explicit loss on the generator aside from training the discriminator at the same time. So if my discriminator is bad and I just say everything is kind of wrong or everything is kind of right, I'm not getting a signal for my generator to generate better images. So you cannot get better than the teacher. If my discriminator is too weak, I have a problem, right? It has to be, it has to be strong enough to tell me what to do. And tell me what to do means it has to discriminate and give me gradients how I get better myself, right? This is like how this process works. Um, on the other hand, if my generator is too weak or if the discriminator is too strong, right? I mean, these are obviously synonyms. Um, my discriminator will always be right. If my discriminator is always right, that's also a problem because then the teacher is going to tell you, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And now you're even more wrong, but it doesn't tell you a good gradient how to get there. In practice, you need good balance. And good balance means roughly, well, discriminator and generator should have a similar capacity. It depends a bit on the problem. You know, there's, there's a diverse set of problems where you could say, oh, sometimes the generator needs to be twice as big. Um, but it's unlikely you see something like, oh, my discriminator is like 20 times as big as my discriminator. So generator, discriminator should roughly be in the same scale. If you find that the discriminator gets too strong, and this is something that will happen, um, you have to figure it out with the, the right uh, training schedule, right? You have to go back here and check how to do that, possibly how to have different regularization and so on. But in practice, you want to have roughly the same capacity. So that, that's very, very important. Um, the next point I want to mention is mode collapse. I mentioned it already. Um, mode collapse is the problem when we only generate a small number of good images. Right? When the generator is generating a small number of good images and the discriminator says, well, they look like real images, seems good to me, but you don't have enough variety. So you need to have enough variety. And this is a problem that happens often very early in the training process. And this is a real issue. And there's this fundamental difference right now, how we are ordering our training. If we have the discriminator in a loop or the generator in the inner loop, right? If my discriminator is in the inner loop, so let, let's, let's see what's happening here, right? I have here, I maximize uh, the discriminator, this is my inner loop, and minimum minimize the generator in the outer loop, right? There. Here's the other way around here. The outer loop is the discriminator, maximize that one, and the generator in the inner loop. Um, if my generator is in the inner loop, which is this case here, um, it's very easy to converge to one sample because what I'm going to do is I'm going to, at the moment, I have a given discriminator, and all I want to do is I want to fool that one discriminator. If I always generate the same right sample that the discriminator thinks is okay, I will not get a very good distribution. So this will always, not always one example, but it will converge very likely to a small number of samples. If you have the discriminator in the inner loop and the, and the generator here in the outer loop, then you should supposedly converge to the right distribution, right? Um, and that's very important, right? That is a very important thing. Because in this case, I have to always be, the, this guy will basically be trained while this guy is being trained, right? And this is what I mentioned before. In this vanilla GAN, this is why you, you have typically first the, the discriminator loops, which is that one, and then the generator loops. However, you can still have different schedules where you can train the generator a couple of times here too, right? You can still do that. This really depends though, but you have to be aware of this problem that it arises. Um, if you're training this guy now in the inner loop, you will typically mode collapse. And that's a thing to, to consider. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about mode collapse. Another interesting thing is the data dimension, what you're using. So, um, so this is a, a graph here. This here, um, th these different curves are manifold dimensions, right? Um, this one is the number of modes that we're trying to recover. And this is the percentage what we actually did recover, right? Um, so if we're having more modes, it's of course harder to recover all of them, meaning that the recovery rate will typically go down. Now, 
what we're trying to measure here is we're trying to have the mode recovery versus the number of modes. So the performance correlates with the number of modes, right? That's what I'm saying. If I have more modes, it will, it will be harder. If my manifold dimension is going to be high, right, this 128, um, yeah, then this is even more extreme. If my manifold dimension is lower, this is a bit easier. So the higher my dimension, the harder. Um, yeah, so part of the reason why we often see GANs on specific domains is because we want to simplify our distribution, right? We simplify our manifold, basically. Um, and because of that, I can most likely recover, well, I wouldn't say all modes, but I recover a lot of modes. Like, you never recover all of the modes, right? And that's unlikely. Well, in this, in this, this is a toy example. This is not a real image example, right? Um, but in practice, um, if you're having a simpler domain, you can recover more modes because you can sample the full domain and then the training becomes easier. If you're having a larger domain, in other words, what could happen is my generator picks a pretty good sample, looks like a real image, it matches most of the other stuff, but then it turns the same image again, right? Then the generator and the discriminator can't tell it apart. So in practice, this is very important here that you're saying um, number of modes makes my recovery rate lower because it gets harder. Uh, and often what we see is, well, we're seeing like smaller distributions, so we don't have to recover so much stuff, basically. This is why faces work pretty well and ImageNet doesn't work so well. Um, let's have a look again at the manifold. Um, well, and we had this partially from the other one, but if you're looking at the mode recovery versus the manifold dimension, um, a larger latent space means more mode collapse, which makes sense because it's harder for the discriminator to figure out this entire space at once, right? It can monitor it, so to say. So here what we're seeing is here, we have the recovery rate again, and here we have the manifold dimension, right? Um, we have also the data dimension. Like manifold is like latent vector Z dimension, right? And this is the data dimension. But data dimension doesn't seem to matter too much here. But basically, it goes down <laughs> the larger the space. But you also want to have enough control eventually, so you want to have a reasonably large space. So this is something you have to also consider, like how big you want to make that space. Um, yeah, the reason why I talked about this mod collapse, this is something you can and should figure out early on in your training processes. Again, how you do it, you just visualize a bunch of samples in TensorBoard, and then you see what's happening. Um, I also want to mention some of the problems that GANs have. And the funny thing is, these images on the first glance look kind of cool and look like a real image. We're getting fooled by this maybe too. But what we see, they're not real images. If you're looking closely, I don't know what's happening here or here, right? It looks like a dog, like a bit of dog here, a bit of dog there. Looks like one, two, three legs here. <laughs> Something went really wrong on these images, but on the other hand, they look kind of a reasonable color distribution. So the global structure is a big problem for GANs. And it's not surprising that if I'm making my image dimension bigger and I have a larger image to generate, this global structure will even be harder to be achieved. Um, in practice, you have to train longer. In practice, you have to have bigger models. But the bigger your model, the longer you have to train, the more likely it is to have things like mod collapse or your, your losses diverging. So that's an issue. Generally speaking with the structure, one, one common problem is you have often problems with counting. Um, yeah, these are fun samples. You have a lot of eyes sometimes. Um, here, a lot of eyes, I think. Um, I don't know what's happening here or here, right? Something went really wrong. Like locally, the features are okay. If I'm gonna give you this little patch here, it looks perfectly fine. But the global counts are just wrong. Um, yeah, one thing you have to also consider, like theoretically what we're doing, GANs are perfectly sound, right? We have this generator and we're learning kind of this implicit distribution. Now the problem, this implicit distribution is still being represented by a series of 2D deconvolutions, right? You have a bunch of 2D operators that have to encode the whole space of images in the training set. And convolutions are inherently a local operator. Um, local means, well, I mean, I have a 3 by 3 conf, I can locally check what's going on. And in order to get a larger receptive field, I have to have a series of convolutions. 
And that's a thing that is very much exhibited in these cases here where, you know, the larger it gets, the more global the structure has to be, the harder it is for Confident to do it. Um, yeah, it's just how it goes. Yeah, okay. So these are common things what we see where we have problems. Um, I talked already a little bit about it, what you can do when you train GANs and how to evaluate it. Um, the question is how do we quantitatively evaluate the performance of GANs? We already noticed that yeah, the, the loss function is not going to cut it for us, right? The loss function is not going to be so easy to, to look at. Um, the main difficulty that we have with GANs is we just don't know how good we are. We don't know whether they converge, we don't know whether we need to train longer, we don't know whether it's not working right now and it will get better and so on. Um, but it is a very, very difficult problem. And the research community, I mean, I'm a researcher, I can say that I'm part of this community, but one, one weakness of the community is often in papers you see very, very good results. And what you can do is you can just sample a couple of times and take the good results and cherry pick them. And that is a, a problem, right? Because we would love to quantitatively evaluate, but it's very difficult. So does it always look good or is only some of them being good, right? What are the good, what are the bad cases? And that's very hard. I can't put it so easily in a table. Um, the second question is, do we just memorize, do we generalize, right? I mentioned, oh, well, we have a training set in the real samples. Do we just memorize a bunch of them? If we're memorizing these ones from the training set, my discriminator, by the way, um, if I'm perfectly memorizing it, my discriminator can't tell them apart. There's no way. So the idea is my training set has to be big enough that my model capacity can't fit in it. That's still the same thing. You can still have overfitting problems here too. Um, yeah, but it's difficult. It's very, very difficult. Um, so what do we do in practice? Well, in practice, one thing I told you, we look at the images. We, we're looking at the human evaluations. Um, every n update steps, you show a series of predictions. These predictions typically should be from the same latent code, right? You have, maybe you're showing like eight by eight images, but they're always the same latent code you're visualizing. Um, check the training curves, if you're diverging, if discriminator is collapsing. Here, check, check, if it's, check if it's getting better or check if we have more collapse. These are the, one, these are the things we can do. Um, at the beginning, it doesn't look very good, but you can check if you have enough variety. If you visualize eight by eight images and you only have like three different types of these eight by eight images and you have a lot of duplicates in there, even they don't look very good and, they have, and you have a lot of duplicates, it's a problem because you just more collapsed, right? Um, this one you see very much early on and if this one goes wrong at the beginning, it'll never recover. That's, that's just a big issue. Yeah, if it doesn't look good, what do we do? Um, we go back, different hyperparameters, different networks, different learning. Most of the time, the learning schedules make a big difference. Um, that's, that's one of the number one things you can try. Um, okay, this is human evaluation. There's also some ideas of doing quantitative evaluations. And one of the most popular ones is called IS, Inception Scores. Um, I can already say there's a caveat. <laughs> the, the inception scores, they're not perfect. They're not telling you 100% what's going on. So the inception scores, they measure saliency and diversity. Um, you typically, um, the idea is basically training an accurate classifier, right? You train an image generation model, and then you check how accurate is the classifier. So can you can you kind of recognize the generated image? That's kind of the high level idea. Um, and you make some assumption of the underlying data. So what do we want to do is, let's say, I'm going to generate images from 10 different classes. And I want to make sure that my classifier can associate each of the generated samples precisely to one class. So let's say I'm generating cats and dogs. Um, if the classifier tells me it's a dog, 100% dog, I'm good. If it tells me it's 100% it's a cat, I'm good. Um, if it's half dog, half cat, eh, they're not so good. Then I generated something weird, right? That's kind of the idea. And this is called saliency. Um, this is the first term we have to consider. Um, Check whether generated image can be classified with a high confidence. And high confidence means you just look at the classification scores. Um, 
really simple idea. Um, works to some degree, right? I mean, of course, um, that's important. Um, we need, however, a second part, which is telling us we need some diversity. It doesn't help us if we only generate good dogs, but no cats. It's not a good thing. So we need to check that we get a, a uniform distribution of all classes. This is what our evolution matrix should tell us. Um, yeah, because it's it's we want to have both, right? We want to have diversity, we want to have saliency. That's what the inception scores are measuring. Um, there's still a problem. And one problem is what happens if you have only one good image per class? And if you have enough classes and we have one image that is good per class, but every other image per class is not so good, or we don't have a lot of other images, we might still be mode collapsed and we might not notice it so well with the inception scores. So even though inception scores might be high, diversity might not perfectly be covered, right? Um, so the short story here is inception scores is what people use to quantitatively evaluate it. There's a couple of variations of this, like FID scores and stuff like that. They're all very similar. But I can already tell you they're not perfect. Like none of them are perfect. Um, so we have to still look at it. This is a difficult problem, right? It's basically like, oh, look at a picture. Tell me how, how realistic is the picture. Like that's the, that's the question we had at the very beginning when we said, well, we need to have a loss function to reconstruct or generate images, right? That's what we're learning with again. But the GAN is learning and we have to evaluate the GAN now. So it's very difficult to do this by hand. Um, there's a few tricks you can do. Um, you can check the discriminator. If the discriminator, um, by the way, it's a, it's a good debugging trick. Whenever you start training again, always train the discriminator first, check if it's going down to zero. Of course, you're not getting reasonable results, but you're checking that the discriminator can go to zero. If that one doesn't work, then yes, something is wrong. Um, but one idea what you can do is you can train a discriminator and again, you can take the features of the discriminator, can put this into a, into a classification network as a pre-trained feature learner, fine-tune a little bit and see if you get good features for that. If that is the case, then you would assume you have trained a good discriminator because you got good features out of it. If that happened, if you got these good features out of a discriminator, you would assume the generator must be also good, right? It's just how it goes. If the generator, um, yeah, the generator must be must be good in, in that case. Um, that's a thing I feel is a bit hacky, but it's at least one way to figure out, oh, do we good feed good features or not, right? Okay, um, that's for now it for, for how to evaluate GANs. Um, but in practice, I can already guarantee you, it's very tricky to train them. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what can we do to make GANs work in practice. In practice, there's three different things you can do. You can fix hyperparameters, right? Um, training schedules, learning rates, possibly optimizers, possibly optimizers, possibly samplings, possibly data distributions, training sets, stuff like that. That's the most important thing we're gonna look at. Um, there's a choice of loss functions. Um, we have seen two loss functions so far. We have seen the, the standard minimax game, right? Uh, we've seen the heuristic method. Um, we'll introduce a couple of more. Um, and then there's a choice of architecture. Um, what deconvolutions do you use? Stuff like that. Um, for the most part, we only kind of look at this one to debug. This is the most reasonable thing to look at. In practice, people always look at the other two, which I don't understand why. So they're changing the loss functions all the time and then they are, because nothing works, change the loss function. That's always a thing, but I think it's a terrible advice. You should always look at these ones here first. Um, in practice, Starting with the heuristic method here is a good idea. Architecture start with the DC again. That's why we, that's why I mentioned it. Um, is also a good idea. They might not be the best ones. They might be better ones. But these things they work if you're choosing the right hyperparameters. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's have a look at a couple of practical things what people have been looking at. Um, and there's this cool website called GANHEX. Um, some of the stuff might be a bit older now. Um, older, like two years old, maybe. <laughs> so, um, but there's a couple of cool things on the ScanHex website, so I wanted to quickly go over it. Um, there's a few things you want to do. Uh, normalize the inputs. That's a no-brainer uh, because you want to make sure your distribution is within a reasonable space. Like, if you have, if the parameter space of your distribution is bad, then it's very hard to learn. Um, what's very important, and this is a general thing, by the way, check out your last layer of your generator. Most people use uh, 
if you normalize it here between minus one and one, you have a 10 H that maps it between minus one and one. So by definition, your generator will generate samples that lie in this distribution. Let's say for simplicity, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use instead of a 10 H, I'm going to use a sigmoid. A sigmoid will map my values between zero and one. Um, but if my inputs are between minus one and one, I think my discriminator has a pretty easy thing to say, well, if there's no negative numbers, it's all fake, right? So these are common problems that people have. Or if you have a reload, oh, by the way, this is the most common bug that people have. They just in the last layer of the generator, they have a reload, and this one is some weird normalization that goes negative. Um, so make sure these two things match each other. <laughs> if they don't, you got a problem, by the way. Obviously, you don't learn anything. Your curse will just immediately collapse. Uh, by the way, try it out, right? I mean, just do something like this um, and use a reload here or sigmoid. Um, I think your discriminator should just go immediately to zero, right? It's just straightforward. Um, sampling. <laughs> what kind of samples do you use? Um, I mentioned before, people can use a uniform distribution. Most people use a Gaussian distribution to sample in the latent space. Um, what people often say is uses spherical sampling. And spherical samples means it is a Gaussian sample, but it lies on the, on the sphere. So your length of the vector is always going to be one. Uh, so you just normalize your sample space. It makes it a little bit easier. Um, the reason is you just, you still have the same control in the terms of the dimensionality, but the number of um, the, the dimensionality, uh, sorry, your effective parameter state space goes a lot, becomes a lot smaller. Okay, and when you do interpolations, you can interpolate uh, on, on this on this fertile sample here. You can say, oh, you have to check uh, on the great circle, right? Like how you interpolate from one sample to another one. Um, there's a lot of literature, by the way, how to do the sampling. You can normalize it to make sure it's on a sphere. You can also not do it. There's a lot of different things. Um, it depends a little bit on the problem. Um, <laughs> batch norm is a fun thing. Um, this is a thing I would take with a bit of a caveat. Um, a lot of people say, oh, don't use batch norm anymore. Um, I would say it depends, but it's it's one thing you can play around with at least. Sometimes you also just need a few options. With, without batch norm, um, that's one thing. Typically people use batch norm, that's what they recommend here too. Um, it depends a little bit on the problem. Um, what you can do is, you can construct different mini batches for real and fake. Um, meaning that you can say one mini batch contains either all real or all generated images. So that helps to stabilize the training a lot. Um, the reason is basically you're getting all gradients for real or all gradients for generated. And that makes, especially for the discriminator, it makes it much easier to train. And um, that's the thing typically people do. It depends a little bit on the batch size. Um, I don't have an advice here. One problem is there's very, there's, um, we'll see this later in the next few uh, lectures. Um, there's this two state-of-the-art GAN methods. One of them is the style GAN line from NVIDIA and the other one is the big GAN, I think that's from Google. Um, these two are probably leading groups like training crazy big GAN models for like weeks basically and try to get good results. One of them uses small batches, one of them uses big batches, um, which is contradicting the settings, um, but they both get good results, um, but in between nothing works. So that's <laughs> it's an interesting thing. Um, the optimizers, people typically use uh, use Adam for the generator, SG for the discriminator. That's a thing you can play around with. Um, this is a standard thing. I don't know. Um, you see this very quickly based on the training curves. If the, if the training curves don't look good, you, have, you can change stuff here. That's the first thing I would always do. Check your training curves and you see this after a few minutes, basically. Um, one thing is one-sided label smoothing. Mm, that's an easy one. You can say in the discriminator, right, like for uh, for the real samples, you just penalize that part a little bit, right? So you have a lambda function here that makes the discriminator here a little bit weaker in terms of the confidence, um, gives it like 0.9 or so. Um, yeah, this encourages a bit more uh, extreme samples, um, which is good, right? It, 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 it doesn't always try to be on the safe side, so it, it makes this part a little bit weaker, so it reduces the confidence here of the discriminator, um, which is which is good. 
by confidence, right? Obviously, what you're getting now, your score functions for the real images will just be a little bit lower. That's all you're doing here. Yeah. This is this one-sided label smoothing. Um, this one works reasonably well. Um, can do it too extreme, of course. 0.9 is a reasonable number here, what people use. Seems, seems plausible. Um, another thing people do is they use historical generator batches. So what you do is you have, uh, you have a discriminator network and a generator network, right? And what you can do is you can generate stuff over a history of iterations. Uh, and you can just mix your, your generated samples in the current batch. So your discriminator will see not just the results of one discriminator, so it will basically see discriminator samples from multiple uh, iterations. Especially at the beginning, this is very important. Oh, it's not important. It's, it's a very good idea um, because you, you will actually stabilize the discriminator a little bit, right? It's not so heavily overfitting to one type of generator, but it's, 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 it's spreading it a little bit out. So it's learning kind of a distribution not of a specific generator, but learning a distribution of all generators. Well, not all of them, but the last n or something like that. Um, this is a relatively good idea. Um, it's, it's, an easy, it's an easy implementation, and it, it seems to, to help quite a bit at the beginning. Um, another thing is sparse gradients. Um, stability of, uh, of the GAN game suffers from gradients of sparse. That makes sense. That's the same thing for every other neural network, right? If you have no good gradients, you're kind of screwed. Um, Leaky reloads is a thing that people often use for both generators and discriminators. Um, I've also seen parametric reloads actually. Leaky reloads seems to be a good, good, good compromise uh, what people use. Um, still high level advice is just use DC again to start. Um, and then once you get this one to train, then you can play around with these things. This one will not make or break it right away if you have a working architecture. Um, Downsampling, use average pooling, conscious strides. Upsampling, use deconscious strides, um, and so on. Um, there's things like pixel shuffle you can do, helps a little bit. But yeah, I mean, this is something you can actually debug. You can go ahead and literally visualize your gradients, right? You can see how good your gradients are. If your gradients go crazy, then something went very wrong. This is something you should be aware of. Um, but you, you can see that actually, right? You can check your gradients. If they go too crazy, then it's a problem. And you see this also relatively early on. Um, another idea is exponential averaging of weights. Uh, one problem is, well, discriminator can be noisy due to SGD, which makes sense. Um, the problem is what you have at the very end of your training process, you're gonna have a lot of impact from the last iteration, right? There's a lot of noise there. So one thing people do is they take basically uh, an exponential average of the weights of the neural network. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to store, let's say I'm going to run my network for a million iterations. And I'm going to take my network and take an average of the last 100 iterations and just average the neural network weights. And you can, of course, not just do a simple average, you can do an exponential average and can compute this running average um, while you're optimizing. Um, and this is very good at the end because then you don't have these outlier samples anymore, these noisy things. Um, so you kind of want to avoid this bias towards the last iteration. Ex and this exponential average is easy to implement. You just keep a second vector of the weights around, you just um, have one update there, almost no cost, um, helps a little bit. This here is not helping your training too much, but it will help your overall results potentially a little bit. It's not going to a major leap, but it's still a good idea for your final deployment. Okay, so these are the things you can play around with. I gave you a lot of options. There's no guarantee that one or the other will fix or will make or break it, right? Um, but at least you want to have a bunch of options what you can play around with. What I could always recommend, start very simple, to have a simple architecture like DC again, um, try it out in MNIST first, then go to cell of A, um, play around with that and, and see how you again behaves. Now, I still want to introduce a bunch of objective functions of the GANs. Um, there's a couple of, actually there's many objective functions again. I'm not gonna go over all of them. Um, with the caveat right now, that don't change the objectives too many times. Typically just use the heuristic method. That's a good idea. I still wanna show you the implications of changing the loss functions, but most of the time your GAN will not just suddenly work because of a different loss function. Um, I mentioned heuristics is standard, that's the easiest way. It's not necessarily standard for deployed networks, but it's something you can always start with.
I want to go over a couple of them. One is EBGAN, BEGAN, WGAN, um, and LSGAN. Um, the loss function again, alone won't work at work. Um, I'm going to quickly go over these. Um, I would encourage you have a read afterwards at these papers. Um, I might go a bit quickly over it. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, but I think it's interesting when you read these papers what people thought about their insights. Um, let's have a look at the at the EB GAN paper. The EB GAN paper, paper is basically EB stands for energy based GAN. Um, the idea here is they're reformulating the discriminator. So basically they're saying my discriminator takes some sample X and the idea is I want to reconstruct this image perfectly. This is just an autoencoder formulation. My discriminator says I want to have a good autoencoder function. Um, this is what my discriminator is going to do. And I want to basically for real images, I just want to say, well, I have good reconstruction. That's it. Autoencoder, we want good reconstruction. Now, what we're doing is we want to say, if we are having a good reconstruction here, and we pre-train this guy, then if it's, if it's a good reconstruction, then it was a real image. If we have a good discriminator trained on real images here, and we're feeding a new image in, and it doesn't have a good reconstruction, then it's not a real image because it wasn't reconstructed well. That's kind of the high level idea. And the way you do this is you simply say, well, when I'm training the discriminator, I'm feeding a real image and a, and a, a fake image or a, a, a latent code in there. Well, let's start with the generator first. So generator gets latent code, generates image, is being fed into the discriminator, right? Um, gonna optimize for that function. The generator tries to make sure that in the same way the discriminator could reconstruct stuff, in the same way you could reconstruct stuff with the generator, right? Um, that's what I'm saying. Like, there should be no difference in the reconstruction quality if it's a real or if it's a fake image. Uh, the discriminator, however, now says, well, um, I'm going to train the discriminator. That's this part, that's the first pass of the loss function. And now I'm going to say, um, I want to penalize the discriminator if the reconstruction error for a generated image drops below a certain value. So I'm, I'm just going to penalize it and say, well, okay, look, um, I want to I wanna drive you apart. I want to say, you were a fake image. You should not be well reconstructed. But I'm only going to do this up to value m. That's kind of what the eBGAN is doing, right? And I'm going to train these two jointly, and hopefully um, I will drive these two apart. I will get a latent encoding for real, I will get a latent encoding for fake, and the idea is if I train both of them at the same time, um, my generator will figure out how to move them together, and the discriminator tries to move them apart. Um, so we're trying to get these latent spaces um, separated out, or together, depending on whether you're the discriminator or the generator. It's a little bit reformulated. Um, BEGAN has a similar idea on that. Um, so BEGAN um, is similar than EBGAN, except now instead of reconstructing a loss, or we measure the difference in the data distributions of the real and the, and the generated images. In other words, we're going to go ahead and we have a real distribution here, we have a fake distribution here, and we're trying to measure the difference between those two. Um, there's various ways of measuring these differences. A very common way what people doing is looking at the Wasserstein distance or the earth movers distance, um, uh, same terminology. And this is this W again, which is essentially, it follows out of that. The idea is I have a distribution here, there's a bunch of blocks and I wanna reorder these blocks and move them from here to here. So I have a distribution P and I have a distribution Q and I wanna figure out how different are these two distributions? And this Wasserstein distance tells me how different they are, right? Uh, and how different are they? Well, I want to figure out how much, how many, how much work do I have to do to move this one from here to here? This is, I have to move this block from here to here is six. Um, moving this five from here to here well, costs also some work, right? So everything you're moving from here, moving the earth from here to here costs you some, some effort. Um, and that tells you how different, if I have n samples here, I have uh, n samples here, I can figure out how different are these two distributions. Um, this works for discrete cases, you can formulate it on continuous cases too. Um, for the sake of the theoretical framework here, we're going to think about continuous distribution, right? But it measures the difference between these two different distributions. Um, 
one slight problem here is um, this is a very costly operator, right? Um, computing Wasserstein distance, very, very costly. Um, there's a few ways how to reformulate this problem, right? Uh, what you can do is you can say you have um, you have these you have a function f of x. Um, you want to figure out basically um, samples from one and samples from another distribution, and you want to want to figure out what the difference here is. And the the, the EMD the earth mover distance can be formulated as the supremum of the difference between these two functions. Uh, sorry, between these two diff diff different distributions, and. This one, however, only holds if this function f that we used for the sample x is one Lipschitz constant. It's a one Lipschitz function. Um, by the way, if you, if you call it Lipschitz, is, Lipschitz means if you have the difference between the two functions, between x, so you have one function f, you're feeding in x1 and x2, the difference between the function values is smaller or equal in the difference the absolute difference between the parameter values you fit in, right? So it's an upper bound between the densities. Um, I'm not going to go into detail how this one here is derived. Um, this takes a little bit more math. You just have to believe me right now. Taking that estimate here, the supremum, will measure, um, it's basically the dual of the earth movers distance. And this is something we want to look at. And the challenge what we need now is we need to find a function f here that fulfills this Lipschitz constraint. And f in this case is a critic function that tells us the quality of x, basically. Right? The sample is from pr and the sample here is from pq. And we want to figure out how far apart are these guys. And what would be nice if I had a critic that would tell me this right away. If I had a critic that told me this for every sample of the distribution, and here I have a critic for every sample of this distribution, um, and I'm getting the expected values of the difference here, then I would know how close my distributions are. Now, the problem is this function is very hard to define because let's say I have a bunch of images, well, who knows how close um, the distribution between these images are. I can do this on a per pixel basis, but computing this earth move distance, as we know, is very expensive, especially if you have a bunch of um, high resolution images. Um, so we do what we always do, um, when we don't know it, simply we learn this function f. So we're learning this critic function. And in this case, f is a neural network, because we want to learn that function. We don't know it, right? Um, the only thing what we have to make sure now is we have to make sure we don't violate this one Lipschitz constraint. So f needs to be a one Lipschitz constraint. And in the optimization process, we just have to make sure that this Lipschitz constraint is not being uh, uh, violated, right? So what we do is we restrict the maximum weight value in f. Um, and the way we do this is we the weights of the discriminator, we just control them by a hyperparameter c. And this is called weight clipping. So what we do is we just say, oh, my weights can't get closer or smaller um, than minus c and plus c, right? So we just restrict the function values, basically. So we have a Lipschitz estimate with c. If I'm taking a bigger c, well, then I have, um, uh, then I'm more loose. If I have a smaller c, then I'm more, I'm more tighter. And we go into this a second, what this means if you have a smaller and a larger c. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is controlled by this hyperparameter C and the weights are still being updated of this critic function. Again, this is just for the critic here. This is uh, for this, this F will become a critic function or is a critic function now that we model at the neural network. We want to optimize the parameters of the neural network by having RMS prop. Um, we do clipping and um, what we're optimizing now is we're optimizing both the generator and a critic. And this is what's happening here. So here we have uh, we have uh, we have a generator, we have a critic, and the critic is trying to measure the distribution, the distance of the distribution from the generator and from the real images. So right again, this is our function that we have. This is the supremum that we're optimizing for. Um, again, if we're quickly going back, that's what we're optimizing for. So we're just taking a discrete number of samples, which is m samples here. Um, 
we want to make sure that the difference between th these two is going to be minimal. At the same time, we have to optimize for f. Like, because f doesn't exist yet. f is a neural network. I don't know the function how to, how to, how to compute the earth mover distance between my samples. Um, so I have to jointly optimize for both the critic that tells me how close are the distributions and I have to minimize the distance between the two distributions. That's what Wasserstein again is doing. Um, yeah, what we do here in practice is we have here, uh, we have the function f, here's the real sample, we have the function f, and here's the fake sample, right? This is what we're doing. Um, again, in order to optimize our, our generator, we are optimizing these two together, we're computing the gradients um, uh, of f and g, right? g has also weights. Um, and at the same time, we're trying to make sure that we're getting a good critic function. Okay, if you're comparing this to the standard GANs, and the reason why I'm going over the Wasserstein GANs, they're actually widely used in practice. Um, if we are comparing this to the standard GANs, uh, we're having here the GAN formulation, right? The GAN formulation, um, we had here the, the, uh, the gradients here for, uh, for the discriminator was the binary cross entropy. Now what we have in the Wasserstein GAN for the discriminator is this critic that measures the, that, that uses the, a critic function and tells me what is the difference between these two distributions. Um, in the GAN formulation for the generator, well, I had this negative log likelihood. I, I basically want to make sure my generator produces stuff that the discriminator doesn't recognize. Um, and here I have gradients that, that, um, that optimize for f, meaning that, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, sorry, I'm basically saying that my critic tells me, oh, it's, it's a good uh, distribution, okay? Um, if you're optimizing that, <laughs> you will get something like that. Um, yeah, what do we get? Um, we have here we have here a loop. <laughs> let's say while well, we're not converged, um, and conversions will become a new a new meaning now because like here again we're optimizing for this critic here. Um, and now what we do is we're optimizing for the critic. We're basically drawing samples from real data. We're drawing samples. So we're generating samples with a latent vector z. Uh, we're optimizing the critic here, right? Um, and we're doing the weight clipping. Um, we do this a couple of times. Our estimates for our f gets better. Then we sample from real and we're trying to make sure our gradient um, generates stuff that with this current function f cannot be distinguished from uh, well, sorry, the critic says, oh, it's a good, it's a, it's a good estimate, right? Um, and then you go ahead and then you iterate. Um, this guy said critic to five. So this loop runs five times for critic optimization and then only one generator update, right? Critic update, generate update. Okay. Um, if you're looking at the, at the GAN losses, you remember we had GAN losses that kind of stabilized like that. And we had this issue that it didn't, we didn't know when it converged. The nice thing about the Wasserstein GANs now is we're getting curves that look like these, meaning that, oh, oh, it goes down actually, right? And why does it go down? It just means that this estimate here for the critic is getting better and better. If we're having a good critic function f that can estimate the distribution between these two set of samples, and this is being very small, this is our loss function, by the way, we're plotting here. Um, if this Wasserstein estimate becomes good, then in principle, well, then my two distributions are the same. And that's very nice about the Wasserstein loss is that it actually has a reasonable, um, a reasonable convergence plot. So my images at the beginning look bad and then they eventually look better and better. Again, DC GAN architecture here only replaced with Wasserstein loss. I'm not saying here that Wasserstein produces necessarily better results. There may or may not. There's a lot of discussion about that. But what I'm saying is, it's very nice to look at the loss curve here because it actually goes down. Um, I mentioned this before, Wasserstein loss, Wasserstein GAN is one of the things people do actually use a lot um, yeah, for, for GANs. So either heuristic or Wasserstein, the other two maybe not, but th this one is a very popular one. Um, yeah, Wasserstein GAN is great. Uh, now we, we see what we're doing, so we have actual convergence. In theory, it should mitigate mode collapse. Um, you can argue about that. Uh, generator still learns when critic performs well, right? These two, they're not, they're, they're not, um, they're not necessarily competing. Um, they are on the same side. Um, 
One problem is this Lipschitz constraint is difficult. Weight clipping is a dirty, dirty hack. This is not a good idea. Um, there's a couple of variations um, of whatever gradient penalty stuff like this what people use. Um, weight clipping is not the best idea ever. If it's too high, it takes a long time to reach the limit. Right? Basically, if, if you're allowing for, for too much of a variation, this Lipschitz estimate is not very good um, because it's too loose. Right? That's what we we be doing. If it's too small, we often get vanishing gradients um, because we don't learn anymore, um, especially when you have big networks, that's a big issue. So either one, you don't train a lot if it's too small because my weights are too being too small or my weight changes are being too small or if it's too high, then my Lipschitz, uh, then my um, uh, Wasserstein estimate is bad. Right? Either one, either one. They, these two, they, these two are problems. So fixing fixing the 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 C parameter here is a problem. Right? Again, there's a couple of variations now, um, but this is a challenging challenging task. Okay. Um, for the losses, there are a lot of variations of of GAN losses. Um, there's a higher level understanding in um, you know. There's a high level understanding in, in meta losses, training, stuff like that, right? Um, but in, the, the practical thing is that D provides the gradients, right? Like D is our learned loss, we're motivated at the beginning, D is a learned loss that we use in order to train G. Um, but there's many variations of that, of course. My recommendation is always start very simple. That's always my recommendation. Like always, divide and conquer is key, right? We want to start simple, get simple stuff to work, and then we make things more complicated. Um, Always start simple. If things don't converge, don't randomly shuffle the, the loss around. This is what I've seen, unfortunately, many, many times. Changing the loss is the last thing you should do. I would always start with the heuristic first. That's the easiest one to get around. Maybe Wasserstein, but, but that's about it. Um, I've seen like people trying to do 20 different losses. None of them worked, and they spent a lot of time on it. Always start simple. If you're doing GANs, I would always start simple. I would start with an autoencoder first without the GAN. Get this architecture to work, use a variational autoencoder next, and then use a simple heuristic GAN. And then you can compare the results of the autoencoder with the variational autoencoder and then with the heuristic GAN. Right? This way you have a direct comparison. And the reason why I'm mentioning it this overhead is it's just very tricky to, to evaluate or to see whether your GAN is working. Okay. Um, yeah, I still have a few more slides, um, but I would like to, um, yeah, roughly come to an end um, of, of, of this video because we already have um, an hour and 38 minutes. Um, I hope this was an interesting first introduction. Um, I know a lot of people of you have already heard about GANs, um, but I think it's still a good exercise to rethink all these, these kind of key ideas of the GANs. Um, and then in the in the next video and next lecture, um, we will talk a little bit more about uh, GAN architectures and what we can actually do with them in practice. Okay. Otherwise, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, see you next time.